All right, everyone, we'll get started. My name is Anna Mahalik. I'm the Youth Engagement Manager for the United Nations Association National Office. I get to work with all of our campus chapters all across the country, our Young Professionals Program, and of course, our Youth Observer Program. And that's the focus of tonight's call. Jalen, who you see in front of you, is our eighth UNA USA Youth Observer. The Youth Observer is one young American who's selected each year to represent the voices of American youth at the UN uh, and Jalen's able to travel across the country, meet with our UNA chapters, go to our events and go to summits at the UN, but you know, we can't travel everywhere. And so that's why we're so glad to be doing this webinar tonight and having it recorded for everyone to get to know Jalen a little bit better, ask mm -hmm. him questions. And, and tonight, Jalen, I'm, I'm mostly gonna just turn it over to you uh, to, to introduce yourself and your personal passion what you're doing as the youth observer, some of your goals. Uh, and for everyone on the call tonight, you can always ask your questions in the chat box as we go along. Start to have a few in mind because I know we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. And then we'll also have time at the end for you to unmute your mic and for you to ask a question over the phone or over your computer audio as well. Uh, but Jalen, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I'm excited for this. Uh, thank you for those who are on and those who will watch. Um, I'm currently in Chicago right now uh, with the UNA USA group out here. Um, and so it's been fun. Uh, but yeah, my goal is to get to know you all more, but I want to introduce you to myself as well. Um, and so like Anna said, if you have those questions, put them down there and I'm watching as well and uh, I'll be able to answer them. Uh, so we can have more of like a conversation. Uh, but I guess I'll get started. Um, I'm from Michigan, uh, as you may have seen on the side. I'm from Ypsilanti, uh, which is just a small township just outside Detroit. Uh, and really, I had moved to Texas when I was um, a junior in high school. So I've been in Texas ever since. Um, and I've pretty much enjoyed my time. Uh, in living in Texas, I go to the University of Texas at San Antonio, uh, studying global affairs. I don't know if there's any international relations majors, uh, <laughs> but I love anything that has to do with world cultures, um, languages, and so that's sort of my uh, sort of my thing. Uh, with the U.S. Youth Observer role, it was really cool because um, this past summer I got the opportunity to work in Saudi Arabia. Um, doing, uh, working with the young people there, creating activities for them, um, and really implementing my nonprofit's curriculum, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but I also heard about the Youth Observer role my freshman year of college. I always knew I wanted to do it just because I love meeting new people, but also love uh, the opportunity to serve um, our world in any capacity. Uh, and so my senior year now, I'm a senior, uh, and so I applied and uh, here I am today uh, and sort of still getting used to the role, but um, I've enjoyed it thus far. Um, and hopefully some of you that are in uh, DC or I'll even be in Florida sometime this year, we can possibly meet up or something. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to give you a little background about where I come from um, and sort of that niche of things, but um, I'll go into more about like the nonprofit that I run and sort of how that got started because uh, my goal with this webinar was to also provide you with a sort of a not just who I am but uh, ways that I got involved and I'm probably around the same age. Um, I'm 21. Uh, so these are some ways I've gotten to act on some of the global goals um, and things in my community. So um, when I first moved to Texas, uh, some of you may have remembered um, there was Hurricane Harvey, uh, which happened around 2017, and uh, it was pretty devastating because I never witnessed a hurricane, and let me tell you, it is not pretty. Uh, lots of people are packing up. It's like, I don't know, I was watching this movie about the end of the world, and like everybody's like buying groceries and uh, that's sort of how I felt. People were buying canoes and getting waters. Like all of them were gone from like the Walmarts. And I was just like, oh my gosh, man. Like, uh, how is it that 
like what are they preparing for? Like this must be really horrible. Um, and so they had been recently used to hurricanes in Houston, but not this one. Uh, so they, Hurricane Harvey hit, as many of you may know, is one of the costliest hurricanes in the U.S. Um, for over 107 confirmed deaths. Um, and it was a pretty sad time, and it still kind of, whenever that um, time comes back up again, um, the people of Houston, the city is just really quiet. Um, but it was it was surreal for me coming from Michigan because I hadn't witnessed anything other than my snowstorm, like, probably. Uh, and so to see that, you know, Hurricane Harvey um, and some of its effects that it had, not just on the environment, um, but on the people, really shifted my lens toward this thing about climate action. And, um, and so I dug into it and I found that scientists were saying that Hurricane Harvey was exacerbated by climate change. And I was like, what does this even mean? Um, and it was like global warming, um, our world's getting warmer. So things are getting in layman's terms worse. Um, and it comes from human contribution uh, as well as things like fossil fuels and other causes. But I just started to really dig in into this subject matter. Um, and I recognized that, A, a lot of people didn't believe that climate change was real. Uh, and so I was like, that's a bummer because like, here we are here in Harvey <laughs> and there's no hurricane that's ever happened like this before. Um, and so I think that brought to my attention having to witness that uh, really brought to my attention the severity of it, like the importance. Um, and so after that, I was just like, it's not only climate change here, but it's also impacting communities. Like some of you may know um, lives that were lost with, you know, some of the wildfires in California, but also Har like Hurricane Harvey, Maria, Irma, the list goes on. Um, and they include lives as well, which makes it a climate justice issue. Uh, one that I feel that we should all be, you know, rallying around. Um, and so a, fr a group of friends and I, we got together and, um, I mean, we didn't really have much. None of us really had a degree yet. <laughs> um, but we wanted to start this group that could help students make projects to potentially solve climate change or if they wanted to do a march for women's rights or if they wanted to do whatever they cared about. We just wanted to be able to equip them with the tools that they needed to turn those into businesses and projects. And that's what we did. Um, we started a nonprofit called Sustainable Youth in Action. Um, and we're about a year and a half old now. Um, and what we've been able to do over the past year is uh, throw events of engagement that, you know, invite students to come out and we, we learn a little bit more about them and what they're passionate about <clears throat> and teach them some of the avenues about how to make projects, such as practical things like what does your project consist of? Is it an event? Do you have partners? Things like that. Um, and so that's what we do um, every now and then. And so like, in addition to that, some of our programming consists of um, <clears throat> consulting with students who already have like businesses or nonprofits and helping them develop their teams um, and develop their projects to be able to impact their local communities. So coming from that to you know, like the Youth Observer role, it was kind of scary because uh, like some of you maybe, I'm like working on a local level to try to, you know, bring a change. And here I am now working, you know, with communities like nationally. Um, and it was just sort of like, okay, uh, this is kind of scary. Uh, but it's cool because each of us plays a part in moving the world forward and it starts in our communities. Uh, and so that's one thing that I had learned from my work with um, SYA is what we call it for short. Um, but really, what's been able to fuel where I'm where I'm headed now as Youth Observer. Um, and so now, as Youth Observer, some of you probably encountered some of my predecessors, like Michael, um, Nicole, Minara. Like uh, they all brought something really cool to the table. Um, be it human rights issues, human trafficking, uh, economic growth, um, and sort of my sole focus, as you probably can guess, is climate action. Um, but I really want to hear about some of the issues you care about as well um, and what you're probably doing and what you're doing or what you're trying to do 
um, to solve those, you know, at home. And so if any of those come to mind, if you're like working tirelessly to see, um, you know, an end with like poverty inside your local community, um, or if you have a project that deals with hunger or anything of those sorts, um, you can start to put those in the chat and um, I can sort of talk on, you know, my experience with that and we can kind of exchange about how we can go about that. But um, in this role, I wanted to continue to talk about uh, the Youth Observer role. Uh, it's pretty unique because it's not necessarily like this role that makes uh, the rest of like, I guess really the person who holds it makes the role. Uh, and so we're, our job, my job is to be able to represent Youth American Voices to the UN um, and to be able to uh, tell the UN what you all are doing. Um, and so basically what's, what's cool about that is that I wanted to make sure when I came into this position that I was able to capture, you know, the stories of you all and um, others, not through maybe what I would assume they are or paraphrase them, but by actually getting your words. And um, so one of the first actions I've taken is to sort of uh, create sort of a form that's still live, um, we can link you to after this, where you can submit your story and, you know, we can hear it and present it to the UN. Uh, and I even, I literally bring those stories with me. So I had a talk just before this and I got to share two of those that I've collected thus far. Um, and I want to keep doing that. Uh, and so that's another little shameless plug, but that's essentially what the Youth Observer uh, does. It, you know, I'm really here to hear those concerns that you all maybe have, but also talk about um, some of those projects. Yeah, like what types of projects y'all are working on. And, uh, and, uh, could you talk about our most recent trip to New York and maybe some of the projects you heard about from students we met at the climate activist training or at the UN Youth Climate Summit? Yeah, yeah, cool. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about UNGA. So this wasn't my first UNGA, this is probably my third. Uh, and so I always just find a way to be in New York City in September. Uh, but this is probably the first time that I was actually going and actually being in the midst of things. Um, and it was a little, I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty hectic. There's so much going on. Um, you've got conferences after conferences and you've got talks and so many different things to pick from. And so some of the things I got to do was um, we at UNA USA hosted a climate activist training. And it was pretty cool because we were able to gather. It was a very intimate group um, of about probably like 30, I believe. Um, and we were able to sit down and talk about uh, what is climate change. Like we had a great presentation over that um, from climate reality, like what it is, what it consists of. And then um, like, how to take those, you know, statistics and things to be able to edge back to like maybe our campus chapters, how to have dialogue about this. Um, but one thing I also learned is that it's not really a, it, it's often caught up as a, like a polarized issue. Um, but I got to meet some other students who were Republican, who are also working on climate change. And so that was pretty cool uh, because we all got, after that training, we went to go to the climate strike that uh, happened um, Friday, I believe. Yeah, it was Fridays for the future. Um, and so that was crazy. Like, it was cool crazy because there were so many people and what inspired me so much was that there were students out there that were probably my nephew's age, like, you know, mm -hmm. six, seven, and they're just shouting like, you know, our future, our planet. And it, it was just really cool like getting to see that they allowed them to miss school, but also like seeing them, you know, really fight for their future. Um, and so that led into the climate summit that I was able to do that Saturday at the United Nations. Um, and we got to meet with delegates from China, Malaysia, Hungary. I mean, students from all over were in the UN. Um, and we got to discuss some actual issues that our world is facing in regards to um, climate change, but really, Climate change touches, and I and I believe this firmly, touches on all the sustainable development goals. Uh, I got to learn that during UNGA about how climate change impacts, and adversely impacts women. Um, and so it becomes sort of a gender equality 
issue, but also it can relate to hunger and life on land and life below water. Uh, and so it was cool to see that everybody coming there weren't just a bunch of like environmentalists, but they had issues that they cared about and found just so happened that climate change really roped those things in. Um, yeah, even and, businesses like Nike. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, <laughs> yeah, Nike, I got to go to a dinner at uh, Nike's New York headquarters and it was on their move to zero campaign, um, which they are sort of uh, arrowing and they're leading the way for other companies. Uh, some of their competitors like Puma and Adidas, I'm sure will start coming out with their <clears throat> their climate projects, but theirs is solely focused on like climate is sport. Like we can't enjoy the sports that we love if we don't take care of our planet. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to have a dialogue there. And that shocked me because I don't know if any of you <clears throat> feel this way, but like I've never really had a good experience with Nike um, and sort of have those preconceived notions about, oh, that's the corporate world. They're so messy and all that. Um, and I was able to share that with them and they weren't offended. They were just like, we know, you know, but we're trying to do something about that. Um, and so they created solely a sustainability office, which is super new. Um, but they created an office solely for working toward how Nike can become more sustainable uh, back away, like urge against the fossil fuel industry and sort of move toward a more equitable world. So that was inspiring as well. Um. Jalen, I think a question that people often have for you or who might watch this later is, you know, what is some tangible ways they can start taking action? You know, if if they've tried reaching out and maybe didn't hear back from a local organization or they're trying to get different clubs on their campus who are very siloed to actually work together. I know that you've led a lot of initiatives at your university where it took many different partners to implement a change. So yeah. what is your advice for, for starting that type of project and building those partnerships? Yeah. So like many of you, you all have something, you know, you're passionate about and we've been consistently talking about through this webinar, climate change and action. And uh, for me, it was like, okay, we have a lot of advocacy going on with, you know, on Capitol Hill, lots of lobbying efforts, um, lots of, you know, meetings with companies to try to get them to divest from fossil fuels, all that good stuff. And it sort of seems like this huge thing that we can only solve with a Green New Deal or we can only solve with a, a huge you know, constitutional thing, which at the same time we do need, but we also need those little projects as well. Um, and so a fraction of climate change issue is human contribution by waste. Um, and so what I was able to do through our nonprofit, and there have been, our school is our university and probably some of you are in university as well, um, has like completely suffered from the use of plastics on campus. We've come up with like, different mechanisms to try to control it with recycling bins, but no one's honestly doing it. Uh, and so we just figured, let's start with something small. And something I always keep hearing, even now after um, I was able to share the story on it, it's like, plastic straws don't do anything. Like, you know, like, why don't you like get rid of something like plastic cups or whatnot? But don't ever let anyone discourage your actions because each, each and every action that you take matters. And so we knew that we wanted to start at a level that was both reasonable, but also act like we could actually see change throughout our four years. Um, and so we were able to do that with plastic straws on our campus um, through a collection of different groups. Like Anna said, it took the collaboration of the Green Society and our Student Government Association and some of those other partners, um, like the people who distribute to our school, uh, is a company called Airmark. And getting to talk with them is like impossible. Uh, but it's really cool because when you make connections, you meet people who could be valuable to your mission. And uh, we were able to talk to Airmark because of our relationship with the president. And so it's pretty cool to see how like a lot of people can be involved in solving such a small thing. Um, because like you would think like, why doesn't, why doesn't the university just act on this if it was that easy to solve? And well, it's because of us sometimes as students, like we don't raise our voice high enough, you know, like we don't 
because they maybe think we're all right with those those plastic bottles. It really doesn't impact them that much. But for a lot of the students, it did. Um, and so that was just one little project we were able to do. Um, and we're still working now with the school to sort of see how we can implement something further over the next 30 years. Um, but it takes time and patience. That's one thing I will say is it's a lot of patience and a lot of hard work. And if you don't see any fruit being bared from your actions, it's okay. Just keep waiting, uh, keep, keep fighting. Um, because I always think about, and I was just talking about this at the last meeting, is you know you have somebody like Greta who is you know sitting outside in the rain by herself you know with these signs up you know championing and telling the world it's time to get serious about climate change and now she's traveling the nation speaking to dignitaries and you know uh participating in Friday for the future like every week um and so that's pretty cool uh that that started from one little action and you never know, something along the line could happen. Uh, and it just, it, it blows up and it's about how you respond to that. And so I think she's been responding really well um, and keeping, you know, keeping it honest and like she's always on the ground still. Um, and so that, I think that's important, but some practical things that I think you all can take away is um, A, like get a team. You know, like these things we're not meant to do alone. Uh, even as I'm here now in Chicago, our team, SYA, they're working like around their schedules as students uh, to make sure that we're accomplishing our mission. And that really warms my heart because like it started with just me, you know, like, and now I don't really need to be there in order for them to do what they already care about. Um, and so like you, all it takes is for you to start the initiative put in the right mechanisms to keep it running. Um, so I would definitely say gather your team, um, be willing to take those risks. I mean, we felt pretty, we felt pretty stupid, <laughs> you know, like telling people to sign petitions to get plastic straws off the campus because a lot of students, which I don't think I've ever told anyone, but, uh, and I don't think I'd said it in the interview, but a lot of students we asked to sign the petition said no, because they were like, they're like, we prefer plastic straws. Like, and I guess it sort of hurt because I would tell them the statistics about how it impacts ocean life and they'd be like, okay, that's, that's not my problem, you know? And so you may encounter people during your work, you know, and advocacy on campus and who may be like, oh, that's not my problem, you know? And it may discourage you, but know that you have a team, you know? If, the, if Unga taught me anything, it was that I was a part of a team of climate activists across the world. Um, so gather your team, take those risks, and honestly, just go for it. Be willing to fail. Uh, that happened over and over again. And even as I speak to you today, we're still failing at some things. Um, but failure, I feel, is a part of the recipe to success. Um, so be persistent with those three things. And I'm sure some of those projects will come out quite nicely. <laughs> yeah, and their team with their university chapter. And if, you, if you don't have a chapter, you can start one or find another student club on campus. But definitely, whenever we get together for our annual global engagement summit or annual leadership summit, it's I know that a lot of our student leaders feel less alone because leadership can be lonely sometimes. When you look at Greta sitting out there for months alone on her protest, she didn't know that it would spark a movement of people to follow her. So she she had to start alone. But you know, at, if you keep coming, if you keep finding uh, your tribe of people like at UNA USA events, I think that you, know, you, you get encouraged and you, and you want yeah. to keep going. Um, I do want to pause here and encourage everyone on the line to go ahead and ask a question in the chat box or just maybe share a reaction that you're having uh, if this is resonating with you tonight, if you have any similar experiences of leadership or what inspired you to take action, we'd love for you to share that. You can share it in the chat box or you can unmute your mic. Uh, we will take questions over the phone. You can unmute yourself using the Zoom function. Uh, so yeah, definitely chime in with those. Uh, but Jalen, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, 
um, you know, how have you been able to work with adults in your community? Uh, you mm -hmm. said sometimes we may not just be raising our voices loud enough, but I hear from a lot of students who feel frustrated, like they don't yeah. feel heard, but maybe they're just not going to the right person or, you know, how have you found intergenerational allies? How have you worked with mentors to locate these different opportunities you've had throughout your life to travel, to be involved with Global Citizen? You know, what, what gave you those opportunities? How did you seek those out? And how did you build those relationships? Yeah, um, I think one of the greatest pieces of, I guess you could call it advice. Um, yeah, really good advice. Uh, came from a man named Lorenzo Gomez, who's really huge in our San Antonio community. He was the CEO of this work co-working space called Geekdom. And he actually just came out with a book um, um, in lieu of World uh, Mental Health Day coming in on October 10th, I believe. Uh, and it deals with like mental health and I'll be able to share that with you. But he always says, um, whenever, I, whenever I got to talk with him, he was always sort of talking about like his, his big break happening because of a man named Graham Weston who had like, and can like, pretty much invested in his life, um, gave him a responsibility and he carried that out. Uh, and like now he's writing books and whatnot. But I think when you're thinking about like intergenerational allies, it's sort of difficult because you sometimes as a, I, I at least me, I feel sometimes like my voice, uh, not only as a young person, but as a black male, in America is sometimes shunned away um, and pre-assumed to not know like what's going on or whatnot. And honestly, there's been moments where I've sat in rooms and I've mentioned something, it wasn't heard, someone else mentions it and they're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And it's just like, oh. uh, like that was my idea. <laughs> um, and so, but there are still people out there who are <clears throat> who are still, who want to be an ally, who want to help you out and want to develop you. And two of those people for me were people like Lorenzo, um, who had took his investment and is now investing it back into our community in San Antonio. Um, but also people like Dr. Eisenberg, who had introduced me to um, the Youth Observer role. She always believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. Like she saw beyond you know, where I saw myself. And so I think that everyone needs that. Lorenzo Gomez calls it a board of directors. And so gather your board of directors. Uh, these are people who are basically, you know, maybe older than you are, who share a fine wisdom, but they also respect the words that you say and they hear you. And on my board of directors are a large list of people who I know I can trust, who will hear me out, and I've pretty much written every recommendation, I've done everything, um, because you're still gonna need those, you know, you're still gonna need the recommendations. And whatnot. So we make relationships, but think about your board of directors and you don't have to exclusively go out of your way to befriend everyone, but it's good to have those people who are fighting for you. Um, and they do exist. So like contrary to the popular youth narrative, there are lots of, you know, people who are older than us who don't hear our voices, but there are still some who do. Um, and even coming back from the UNA, USA in Chicago, um, there are lots of people in that room who are 20 years older than me, like far beyond, but who still sat down and listened to me. And the reason being is that they wanted to become knowledgeable. They wanted to understand what they can do to be allies to help us, you know, in our mission. Uh, and so I always tell people like, we did that, my nonprofit through a fashion show, and it was pretty cool because, like, it was completely run by young people, operated by young people, catered, literally, by people under 26. Um, but one of our gracious donors was uh, not only a male who is, like, over the age of 40, but he's also Republican, you know, championing climate change and waste. Like, mm -hmm. what? That exists. Um, and so... Don't ever shy away from those things, is what I would say. Yeah. Communities with you and at USA, you know, in 35 states. So, um, 
we're starting to wrap up here. So everyone, this is your last chance. If you have any questions, uh, let's pause for a second and feel free to chime in. Hey, this is Arslan. I'm from Washington, DC. Um, I had a good question to ask. Um, so when you're applying for the UN Youth Observer role, um, what, what, what do you think are some qualities that um, that made you stand out from the crowd that you think kind of gave, gave you the ability to, um, to become the next UN Youth Observer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jalen, I can definitely help, help with this one, but do you want to take a first shot at it? Oh, we lost Jalen for a second. Um, but let me answer that while Jalen is getting back online. So, um, so again, my name is Anna. I help manage the Youth Observer Program. What we look for in that position is definitely someone who has great speaking ability. They will have to speak in front of, of crowds. So one way we try to get a sense of that is through their writing and their communication, through the original essays that we ask. And then we also um, ask them to send in a video through their application process. So definitely something that made Jalen stand out is he, even through video, was able to um, kind of come across, reach across the screen and feel like we knew him, like he was engaged. Uh, and so that was one thing. He also was able to demonstrate a project that he led. And so with um, him helping to ban plastic straws on his campus, it was a very tangible outcome that he could write about for one of his essays. So it's really important to be able to lead a project this coming year that you know fits in with one of the sustainable development goals. And um, you know that's something we can look at through essays and that you know the youth observer can demonstrate through their application their writing skills because they will be doing a lot of blogging their social media skills because they run their own social media channels um so jalen i just gave the overview of what the application process entails um with the video the social media exercise and the essays and and having a specific project but maybe you want to speak to you know your your social media plan that that you originally like maybe wrote about or came up with because you've created this amazing master document that helps you plan your schedule for the year. And I think that's something that we kind of saw a glimpse of through your application that is ultimately like manifested itself as making you like a great youth observer, someone that like lived up to everything we, we saw in your application, but social media being, being one of those. So maybe you want to talk more about that side of things. Yeah, so I'm assuming the question was along the line of the application process. Yeah, and what and whatnot. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, it was fun process. Uh, very, <laughs> they crafted it really well. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, yeah, the social media piece of it is a huge part of the position and being able to engage and keeping everyone informed. Um, I think is a huge part of, you know, the youth observer role um, because communication is important and it's really key how we communicate. Uh, and so those are some of the things I talked about in my application was how I've seen failures in communication, um, but also seen successes in communication and what do those two look like. So like, how do we convey, you know, what's happening at UNGA without, you know, sort of maybe talking talking about specific people we don't like at UNGA, but like how do we convey that in a way that people can capture it or, you know, you know, do it. It takes a lot of work and like Anna said, I do have a, <laughs> a document, <laughs> pretty extensive one, but I only do that because uh, I think a lot of the application came a little easy because of my experience running a nonprofit. Um, and being doing all the, that paperwork, and if, if anybody has ever dealt with a nonprofit, doing all the paperwork is just it's all ridiculous. So, like, I think planning, um, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so I just wanted to make sure I had those things outlined. And one of the media approaches that you may notice um, is that I was shooting for a more, uh, you know, cleaner Instagram page, but also 
many avenues that you stay connected. Um, and so it will be, what you can look forward to is I'll be starting these things called uh, Wisdom Wednesdays. Um, always like, get you some, it gives you something to look forward to every Wednesday and just come on and share some of the life lessons. Or maybe it's not what I have learned, but maybe others and I get to share those. Um, but we also have this series coming uh, called Young Minds Connect that I've been really working hard on. Um, as well as that submission form that I told you about earlier that will remain live throughout the rest of the year where you can submit your stories and you can trust that they will be heard. Um, if not at a general assembly by the rest of the world, because I think that's important that we hear others, not just my story, but how some of you are, are getting into the, you know, heavy lifting and grit of uh, solving some of these global issues. So uh, that's so three, just three practical things that I've either done already or plan on doing. Um, and that all just stems from me wanting to just do the best that I can. So, <laughs> um, and I'm always open for suggestions as well. But if you plan on, you know, applying one day to do the youth observer role, there's so much we can talk about. <laughs> Other questions? If not, we can close uh, with a question that was asked through the chat box around, you know, do we plan to do regular webinars? Just so you all know, we do regular webinars with UNA USA on different issue topics. Uh, and some of them are, are interactive like this one. Some of them are very issue focused. Um, so we will have our next big young professionals webinar for especially for students will be in November with the US UN mission and we'll be talking about UN careers. Uh, but Jalen, you know, that brings up a good point of just how you, you, you've mentioned some of it, but how can we stay in touch. How can we keep this conversation going outside of this webinar. Yeah, I mean, personally. Uh, I want to be able to stay connected with each of you, um, and I, I literally mean that. Um, and there are some useful avenues, like there are some mediums that I utilize a lot of, which you've probably already guessed is already social media. Um, there are students who will direct message me. Um, actually, really cool. I think a student that like DM'd me about a project they're working on in like some part of Africa. So I mean, you know, like that's cool, like let's talk. Uh, and so I have a toolkit that I can share with you if you're actually trying to start projects or you're trying to start a nonprofit of your own. Um, and so one of the avenues is through direct message, but um, I'll also be able to, I'm not sure how I can be able to share my email or uh, anything like that, but I wanna be able to share that with you all um, and stay in contact. Uh, and I think the last way that you can stay involved with with, um, with me personally is I'll probably be, uh, I will be probably at most of the major events, uh, including the engagement summit and um, the leadership one in June as well. And so if you're there, you know, just say, hey, I was at that webinar. I was on the webinar, like, and let's connect, let's meet in person. Um, so those are some ways you can stay uh, in touch with me personally. If you're wondering about what's happening at the UN, those are the social media channels is what I utilize to be able to put out information toward you all. Um, so that's universal through the US Youth Observer channels are through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So that's how you can stay updated. Awesome. Well, I'm to follow along with your journey. If you take them behind the scenes, get the insider look of what's happening at the UN and all the different places you're traveling to, like Chicago. So, you know, good luck with the rest wow. of this trip. Uh, exactly. For everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and stay in touch. Uh, if you're interested in applying, uh, if you're interested in the Youth Observer position, uh, applications open up in the spring and we'll probably do another webinar or chat series specifically about the application closer to that time. Uh, but Jalen, thank you for everything. You're really always in, have an inspiring word for us when we hear you. <laughs> thank you and all. Thank you all for tuning in. It's been great. I hope everyone has a good night. Yes. Bye. <laughs>